Ever wondered how a being so powerful and superhuman as a Primarch could listen to the whispers of the Dark Gods and turn on their father? I've summarised each Primarch's reason for turning so you don't have to listen to a few audiobooks worth of information. Lorgar Aurelian and the Word Bearers At the heart of the Word Bearers Legion, there has always lurked the ruinous powers. Only in one man did this originate, the most loathed individual in all of 40k lore, Erebus. But soon as we know, this corruption was to affect many more in Topolan Empire. The gods of chaos whispered to Erebus even as a child back on his home world of Colchis. Colchis was a very spiritual world, however, at its roots lay a dark history of worship of the dark gods which explains the darkness within Erebus and the Pantheon's attention beyond the fact Lorgar's pod was to land here, not a coincidence. Erebus was inducted into the ranks of the word bearers during their first intake on Colchis. Here, his fake piety and scheming would see him rise to the honoured rank of first chaplain, a position from which Erebus could more easily influence his primogenitor, Lorgar Aurelian. The word bearers were fervent in their worship of the Emperor as a god among mortals. They would take many more months and sometimes years on campaign compared to the other legions due to the time it would take Lorgar and his legion to indoctrinate these populaces into worship of the god Emperor. When the word bearers legion were chastised by the Emperor for their worship of him, a direct contradiction to his imperial truth, Lorgar's soul was in turmoil. He had lost his purpose in life and was utterly crushed. Erebus along with Lorgar's adoptive father from Colchis, now first captain of the Legion, Corferon, recognised this as the most opportune time to begin whispering to Lorgar of other entities in existence which would welcome his worship and attention. In fact, these entities were far more deserving of it than his father, who had so unashamedly admonished Lorgar. Lorgar did not agree with the Emperor's imperial truth. He believed there was something divine to life in the galaxy, that he was determined to interact as closely as possible with this divinity. Lorgar and his legion, along with a small detachment of custodies to oversee their efforts following the censure, the word bearers travelled through the galaxy on a journey known as the Dark Pilgrimage. The purpose of their journey was withheld from the custodies to ensure they would not alert the wider Imperium. The Dark Pilgrimage was a superstition from Colchis' early culture which detailed the path a mortal would follow to bring themselves closer to the Chaos deities. This eventually led the Legion to Cadia, where a primitive race of superstitious people dwelt in close proximity to the Eye of Terror. Cadia's populace were devout worshippers of the Chaos Gods. Lorgar met the leader of the people, a priestess called Ingathel, whose insight and divinations would help Lorgar further along the road to damnation. Ingathel would take the Ferrated Sun's chapter, including Argul Tal, into the Eye of Terror to investigate further along the Dark Path. Within the Eye, all of the mortal crew died and many Astartes, from who remained the individuals were possessed by dark warp entities and would be the first ever Chaos Space Marine possessed, true possessed. Upon their return to real space and Cadia, these Marines would be organised into a crack unit called the Gal Vorbach. They would relay to Lorgar all they had witnessed within the Eye. Lorgar would make his own personal pilgrimage within the Eye, accompanied by Ingathel, and would be fed a twisted and one-sided history of the Chaos Gods, a primordial truth which called to Lorgar to embrace it. At the end of this journey, Lorgar was presented with a choice to kill his brother Gilliman and achieve personal glory and payment in kind for his humiliation by the Emperor, or leave the Primarch to live and realise a more likely chance of fulfilling his glorious mission to bring about the mass worship of the ruinous powers to all of humanity. So it was that over the coming years, Erebus and others from the Word Bearers Legion would infiltrate their brother Legion's forces through the use of warrior lodges. They would turn Horus, the greatest of Primarchs, against his father's purpose, and would ultimately be the cataclysm for the unfolding of the Horus heresy. Horus Lupercal and the Sons of Horus Horus Lupercal was viewed by many of his Primarch brothers, even if begrudgingly, to be the greatest among them. So it was, at the conclusion of the Ulanar Crusade, the stage is set on the planet of Ulanar itself 
for a great victory parade. Thousands of square kilometres of area were levelled and reinforced to prove sturdy enough for the traffic to come. 14 Space Marine Legions, millions of Guardsmen, entire Titan Legions and more assembled. It was during this victory assembly that the Emperor of Mankind chose to appoint Horus as War Master in his stead as the Emperor announced he would return to Terra. A great honour and grand show to surely impress upon Horus how trusted and important he was to his father's vision for the conquering of the known galaxy. Despite all of this, a small part in the back of Horus' mind seethed that the Emperor would not share his reasons for leaving his sons, a form of abandonment in Horus' eyes. Horus would go on to prove an exemplary leader of not only men but his Primarch brothers also. His charm, charisma and insight winning over many of his brother's loyalty and confidence. These characteristics, as well as his brotherly bonds, would serve Horus well once his deterioration to a pawn of chaos had begun. During this time, we know Lorgar and his lackeys in the form of Erebus and other key word bearers had already begun infiltrating their brother legions in the name of chaos with the intention to rally support from within their brother legions ranks to rebel against the Imperium. Erebus himself, master of manipulation, had become a very close confidant of Horus and would travel with Horus' own legion at times. It was one of these instances where a part of the crusading force led by Horus would discover a race of humans who identified themselves as the Interax. The Interax were technologically advanced but were very cautious of the crusading fleet's agenda as the Interax were knowledgeable of the forces of chaos and suspicious that the legions could be agents of the Pantheon. Unknown to Horus, while he and his chosen diplomats and bodyguards were on the surface of the Interax world of Zenobia, Erebus stole away with a chaos artifact being stored by the Interax called the Kynebrak Anathame. It was with this artifact that Erebus and Lorgar would corrupt Horus in the time to come. Fearing their suspicions confirmed, the Interax began hostilities against the fleet. In the ensuing conflict, the Interax were annihilated. Erebus, under command of Lorgar, would then gift this corrupted blade to the planetary governor of a planet called Davin. In time to come, Horus' fleet was recalled to Davin by the word bearers, Erebus informing Horus the planetary governor had rebelled. The governor named Ergen Temba had become corrupted over the years of possessing the tainted blade. Whilst Chaos whispered to Ergen, Kor Pharon and his chapter of word bearers gradually corrupted the population of Davin. When Horus' fleet returned, they did battle with plague zombies and eventually managed to pierce the downed starship where the governor was thought to reside. Upon the ship, Horus slew Temba but was mortally wounded by the corrupted blade in turn. Horus was rushed to the Medicae on board his flagship, but not even they could stem the destruction taking its toll on Horus' body. As the threat of losing their farmer and Primarch, one of the immortal sons of the Emperor sank in. Abaddon, first captain, the sons of Horus, and the rest of Horus' advisors gave leave to Erebus to transport their lord to a secret cabin on Davin. During his time at what was actually Serpent Lodge, a cabin run by a Chaos cult, Horus, in his unconscious state, would be shown visions of the future. In these visions, the Emperor held himself above all others and was worshipped as a god. The Pantheon played on Horus' earlier paranoia that the Emperor, contrary to his imperial truth, actually did think of himself as a deity and planned to rule the human race as such. The Chaos Pantheon healed Horus' wounds and allowed him to recover from the infection the blade had caused. Horus now believed in the Emperor's Crusade of the Stars to be a falsity to garner himself power and worshippers began to work closely with Lorgar and his Warbearer Legion. Through the warrior lodges of each legion, they would learn who would side with the War Master in the Civil War to come. And so began the Horus Heresy, a conflict which Horus would spearhead, joined by his pantheon of malevolent allies. In retrospect, we can see that the future the pantheon showed Horus in his fevered state was in fact true, but it would only come about by Horus' own hand in rebelling against his father and mortally wounding him above terror during the siege of the Imperial Palace. Altharius Omegon and the Alpha Legion Quote by Altharius from the Black Library novel Legion I stand for the Emperor. In all things I am loyal to him and I cannot break that bond. He has many great ambitions and the noblest of intentions. I know above all else he is determined to stand firm 
against the rise of chaos. He has always known the truth of it. The overthrow of the primordial annihilator is his greatest wish. So what I do, Ortark, from this moment on, I will do for the Emperor. What for certain can be said of the twin primarchs of the most secretive legion? Many facts in history pertaining to the Alpha Legion are but clever ruses or misremembered history. Even prior to Horus's betrayal, the Loyalist Alpha Legion maintained a tight and well-drilled network of spies and saboteurs throughout the breadth of the Imperium, even within their brother's legions. They were masters of deception and sabotage, loyal as they were. Even in current law set within the 41st millennium, there is still much doubt within the fan base as to the allegiance of this legion, as well as which Primarch was killed during the duel with Rogel Dawn. It was our Alpharius guys to deal with it. It is fitting then that the Alpha Legion's turn from life was brought about by a manipulative council comprised of various Xenos races called the Cabal. Upon the world of Nerth, the Alpha Legion had cornered the Cabal's agent, a perpetual named John Grammaticus. More on him another time. Grammaticus had intended to bring those he thought were his friends to the Cabal, and they could in turn communicate to the Alpha Legion the Cabal's intention to aid the Alpha Legion as well as the wider human race. In a true gotcha moment, John's close friends were in fact Alpha Legion operatives, and the Alpha Legion Primarchs, as well as a small entourage of warriors, were beamed right into the Cabal's midst. The conversations that followed were tense, and the Cabal risked a lot more than the Astartes realised to reach out in this manner to representatives of the Imperium. Through a vision called the Acuity, which it was claimed by the Cabal could not lie, the Primarchs and their entourage were shown a future wracked by war. A galaxy-spanning conflict would engulf the human race with the Primordial Annihilator in the Ascension, a process that was already underway. It was told that in Horus, the human race would create the greatest monster of all. Above all, they were told that this future could not be stopped. It was too late for that. It was explained though, that between Alpharius and Omegan's efforts, they could deviate these future events into a more favourable outcome for the wider galaxy. The Cabal detailed two potential outcomes to the ensuing conflict. Horus would be allowed to win the war, and Chaos would revel in its triumph, though the sliver of honour that remained within Horus would eventually drive him into a self-loathing and fury that would see the human race entirely extinct within one to two generations. The remaining races of the galaxy would be safe thanks to the sacrifice the humans would make. Alternatively, the Emperor would be victorious and the forces of Chaos would wane, though this would come at the cost of the Emperor being mortally wounded and confined to the Golden Throne. The Primarchs were shown an Imperium that without the Emperor's leadership had stagnated and declined from its once glorious heights. Chaos though would seep back into man's domain and be victorious in 10 to 20 thousand years. Although the concept of allowing Horus to succeed in his machinations disgusted the twin Primarchs, the Acuity had shown them a far worse fate for the galaxy, and the Primarchs were filled with grim resolve. They knew what they must do. Following this realisation, and determined to fulfil their new objective no matter the cost, Alpharius and Omegon ordered the annihilation of all staff and soldiery aboard the Imperial Navy vessels accompanying the Astartes flotilla in space. The twin Primarchs would heed the guidance of the Cabal and do what they believed was right for the greater mass of humanity. The Alpha Legion would travel to his Fame 5 and join in the carnage and treachery of that infamous battle. Magnus the Red and the Thousand Sons It's no secret the Thousand Sons would sacrifice much for their pursuit of knowledge, even before their fall to chaos, and it is even more well known that Magnus did a lot that was wrong. The circumstances surrounding the Thousand Sons turning, though, were tragic indeed. Upon the Emperor's return to Terra from the Great Crusade, appointing his son Horus as War Master in his stead, Big E began working on his secret Webway project. The Webway Project was a series of pathways through the warp which would gift the human race the ability to traverse the galaxy far more safely than the standard warp travel via ship. 
This was an integral part of the Emperor's life work and very important to his grand plan. During this time, Magnus was to learn of Horace's betrayal and plan to turn the legions on one another. In an attempt to warn the Emperor of this inevitability, Magnus performed a mighty ritual, sacrificing 900 human thralls life force to empower him enough to find the Emperor through the shifting currents of the warp. Magnus' intention was to use the webway to aid his consciousness in travelling the remaining distance to Terra, but was not able to enter the golden lattice work of the webway out of fabric, as he lacked the strength to break through and could feel the life force of his thralls slowly dying one by one as he spent their essence to travel and attempt to break into the webway. At this time, an incredibly ancient and powerful entity from the warp reached out to Magnus and freely gifted him the power and strength needed to break through the lattice webway. Magnus, in his ignorance, believed this entity to be a contradiction to a lot of the negative emotion in the warp and that the essence was aiding him with no ulterior motive. We, of course, recognize this entity as the Chaos God cinch. Underneath the surface of Terra, inside the erstwhile imperial dungeons, but now a massive laboratory, dwelt the Emperor, surrounded by his closest custodian guard. He was inside a chamber laboratory, which housed thousands of technical adepts, logisticians, and other serfs to the Imperium. On one end of this massive chamber stood a set of golden doors like that to a fortress. On the other, a portal, which was linked to a golden throne, which was situated in the centre of the room. This was the heart of the Webway project. Many ancient and irreplaceable machines and engines whose workings would defy the knowledge of the most achieved Mechanicus Adept. Upon breaking through, Magnus' desperation and recklessness caused untold destruction at the working the Emperor had combined to bring the Webway project to life. All of a sudden, the portal glowed with a bright golden shine Energy lashed out, flensing to the bone those who did not flee. Warding runes engraved throughout the chamber, meant to protect against demonic incursion, burst and exploded. Gun turrets trained onto the portal, ready to take apart any threat which emerged. Centuries of work was undone in an instant, as irreplaceable machinery was ruined. As all present looked on in horror, Magnus emerged through the portal as a being of light and energy confusing those who looked upon him. The Emperor recognised his son, and his heart broke as he realised Magnus was responsible for all of this destruction. As their eyes met, Magnus understood instantly how terribly he had misunderstood the powers of the warp, and so much more. He could see his father's intention for him to sit on the Golden Throne and guide humanity to their destiny. It broke Magnus to know he had shattered this dream through his own ignorance. As he allowed his essence to fly back to Prospero through the warp, Magnus could see the armies of demons amassing, ready to spill through the holes in Terra's defences he had so recklessly made. As a result of these actions, and the fact that Magnus had so willfully disregarded the Emperor's decree of Nikea, which disallowed the use of psychic powers by the legions, the Emperor called for Lehman Russ and his Space Wolves Legion to travel to Prospero and bring them to him for judgment. While en route, Horus convinced his brother Lehman that the Emperor had a change of heart and that the Thousand Sons could not be allowed to live. The Space Wolves would further earn their mantle as the Emperor's executioners. Magnus knew what was to come and had the planetary defences deactivated and the legionary space vessels sent away. As the wolves made planet fall, they were practically unmolested and landed on force, ready to deal out bloody retribution in what they believed was the Emperor's name. As the wolves butchered their way through Prospero's capital city of Tisca, Magnus looked on in shame. Eventually, as his own legionaries were mercilessly butchered as Maleficarum, citizen cut down and the irreplaceable libraries of knowledge destroyed, Magnus came to and figured to himself he had not strayed so far as to deserve this level of reprimand. He descended from his tower to aid his sons in battle and duelled his brother Lehman in single combat. Magnus provided fair competition but was overcome by Lehman. Magnus was raised aloft by Lehman and brought down over his knee, Magnus's back breaking for all to hear. With the intention to execute Magnus with his frostblade, 
Lehman brought down his sword to finish his brother. As the blade fell towards him, Magnus whispered in a dark tongue, swearing his fealty to the cinch and damning his legion for all time. In an instant, Magnus, his legionnaire sons, and the city of Tisca were transported to the war upon a demon world Sench had prepared for his new servants. Angrom and the World Eaters From a young age, Angron was attacked and afforded little chance to come to terms with who or what he was. From an Aldari force attacking him as a child, upon the world his pod had landed on, through to his capture and enslavement as a gladiator by the ruling class of Nuceria. Through the novels, most notably his Primarch novel, we see a glimpse of the empath Angron could have grown into. There is no official source to state this as fact, though we do see Angron has the empathic power to understand another soul's pain and to replace this pain with peace was at least one of Angron's Primarch powers. Unfortunately, against his will, during his enslavement on Nuceria, Angron would be implanted with devices called Butcher's Nails. Little is understood of these archaic and barbaric devices other than when implanted in the way the Nuceria enslavers would, these devices bit deep within the brain matter and pain receptors of the victim, making them incredibly hostile and violent. Due to Angron's Primarch anatomy, his nails would drive him mad and take such a toll on his body as it constantly tried to repair itself. Upon discovering Angron of the world of Nuceria, the Emperor beheld the ruin of a Primarch. Barely able to contain his own fury and on the verge of leading an army of gladiator rebels against a superior professional armed force the following morning, surely leading to his demise. When the Emperor requested Angron leave with him, Angron refused, preferring to die by the side of the only family he'd ever known or cared about. Unfortunately for poor Angron, the Emperor disregarded his wishes and secretly abducted Angron from the planet on the eve of battle. His fellow slaves were butchered to a man, believing Angron abandoned them. This is a sin for which Angron never forgave the Emperor, and the bloody climax which would poison him against his creator forevermore. To say Angron bore no love for his father is a severe understatement, for he has always and will always hate him greatest of all, even prior to the age of heresy. Angron's ways as Primarch of his legion were bloody as his roots in Nuceria, and his sons, in an effort to please their distant father, would volunteer to have the butcher's nails implanted in themselves also. So it was that a legion of bloodthirsty ravagers crusaded through the galaxy in the Emperor's name. They cared nothing for the golden vision of the Imperium of Man, only for martial status and relief from the nails that slaughter brought. Eventually when Horus, already under the influence of the Pantheon by now, was sent to speak sense to Angrom, it was little effort to convince the Red Angel to side with Horus in toppling down what the Emperor and his erstwhile sons had built. Angron, from the very outset of his betrayal, has made it very clear that he would not turn from the Emperor just to serve a deity, but would do so for the chance to lay low the weakling Emperor with his own hand. Fulgrim and the Emperor's Children Fulgrim, the epitome of physical perfection. Though this trait extended to more than just Fulgrim's beauty, he and his legion, the Emperor's children, would strive to perfect every aspect of their lives and military careers. From art to swordplay, the gene line of Fulgrim were the pinnacle of flawlessness in all things they did. So fiercely loyal and favoured was this legion that they of all Space Marine legions were the only ones allowed to adorn their armour with the Emperor's Imperial Aquila an honour presented by the Emperor himself during the Great Crusade, following the Emperor's children's defence of him during an insurrection. Unfortunately, Warhammer lore doesn't abound with happily ever afters, and Fulgrim, along with his legion, would have their faith and integrity tested beyond even their superhuman endurance. It was during battle with a Xeno-Serpentine-like race called the Lair that Fulgrim would take his first steps towards a future of hedonism and excess. 
The Lair were, unbeknownst to Fulgrim and the wider Imperium, a race completely subservient to the will of Slaanesh. Through battle and conquering of the Lair race, not only would Fulgrim begin his journey of supplication to the Prince of Pleasure, but his chief apothecary, Fabius Bile, would discover that the Lair and race would genetically enhance themselves to better reflect their purpose in life. This strive for perfection and the arrogance that accompanied it are also genetic marks which helped the influence of Slaanesh to root itself so thoroughly within the Legion. Interestingly, these findings would lead Fabius to experiment on his brother Legionnaires with Fulgrim's blessings. These Legionnaires would go on to become the very first noise marines in history known as the Carcophoni, though that is a story for another video. With the final battle against the Lair One, a raging tumult of Bolter and Blade around the centre island of the Lair landmasses, Fulgrim, members of his legion, as well as mortals from the Remembrances Detachment, were all simultaneously corrupted when they set foot within a Slanesh dedicated shrine. Fulgrim would claim the Lair Blade, which rested on a pedestal at the centre of the temple. Unbeknownst to all, this blade was possessed by a greater demon of Slanesh, and its whisperings would prove pivotal in the Dark God's efforts to corrupt in Fulgrim. As the months dragged on following the blade's discovery, the demon possessed Lair Blade would speak to Fulgrim through his subconscious subverting Fulgrim's sense of pride and duty to the Emperor. Fulgrim would begin growing jealous towards the love and devotion his father was shown by others, especially those of his explorator fleet. His paranoia would peak when, during a joint effort with his most beloved of Primarch brothers, Ferris Manus, Ferris and his fleet would intervene during a conflict between Fulgrim's own fleet and that of the Diasporus. During this battle, Ferris Ironhands would capture the bridge of an enemy vessel Fulgrim himself was battling on board to capture. Instead of seeing his brother's acts of bravery and selflessness as they were, a demon blade warped Fulgrim's perceptions and emotions to force Fulgrim to see Ferris as stealing victory and glory from Fulgrim. This alone speaks volumes of the corruption already brought upon Fulgrim. This is because Fulgrim and Ferris Brotherhood is perhaps the closest of all Primarchs, with Ferris stoicism and pragmatic outlook counterbalancing Fulgrim's arrogance and flamboyant nature. Given the anger and paranoia Fulgrim felt towards Ferris at this time, it is clear to see how rotten his soul was becoming. Soon after this action, Fulgrim would experience an encounter with the Aldari Farseer, Eldrad Ulthran from the craft world Ulthwe. Eldrad, accompanied by a small force of his own, would attempt to communicate with who he believed to still be a loyal and noble Primarch. Eldrad would speak of Horus' wounding on Davin and the inevitable corruption that would follow. He did this in an effort to try and raise alarm within a loyal Imperium to try and either stop the heresy or, probably more in line with the Aldari persona, influence the various paths of fate in the Aldari race's favour. Fulgrim, furious that his brother Horus would be accused as such by a Xenos, flew into a fury and along with his bodyguard, slew many of Eldrad's force before the Farseer managed to withdraw. Eldrad realising he was too late to prevent the ruinous powers corruption of Fulgrim. Fulgrim would meet with Horus following this encounter. Instead of Horus providing an explanation and account of himself to Fulgrim surrounding his time spent at Davin, Horus instead played on Fulgrim's jealousy of their father the Emperor, and Fulgrim's own pursuit of perfection. With much of Fulgrim's strength of will depleted subconsciously fighting the mental predation of the Lair Blade, Horus was able to convince Fulgrim to side with the Chaos Pantheon. They could aid in rescuing the galaxy from the clutches of their hypocritical father, as well as empower Fulgrim in such a way that he and his legion would achieve perfection in all things. And so the Palatine Phoenix, most beautiful son of the Emperor, would turn from his path of righteousness and tread a new, dark road to damnation. The events that followed Fulgrim's corruption by Horus would result in thousands of loyalist legionaries being slaughtered at the turn of the heresy. He would also see Fulgrim kill one of his brother Primarchs, the first of only four ever Primarch or Primarch confirmed kills. Conrad Kurz and the Night Lords Formed into a murderous vigilante on the nighttime world of Nostramo, Conrad was not of sound mind, even before he inherited a legion of gene wrought warriors. Racked by painful visions of possible futures, this Primarch's abilities pushed him into a dark place before his discovery by the Emperor. 
eventually his torturous and murderous ways would earn him the fitting title of Night Haunter. As a punishing figure of cruel justice, he would appear to criminals and sinners alike, determined to scour Nostramo clean of its criminal presence. Eventually his efforts shocked the populace enough into leading more lawful lives, and he eventually became a planetary dictator. Conrad's dark sense of justice and obedience would change his planet and his soon-to-be legion ever more for the worse. During the Great Crusade, after his discovery by the Emperor, Conrad's Night Lord's legion performed admirably. They did so in a manner that was brutal beyond any of the Emperor's legions. The Night Lords embodied the Night Haunters exacting measures of justice, and those systems who did not willingly join the young Imperium of Man would pay the ultimate price for their folly. In Conrad's absence, his homeworld of Nostramo, from where the Night Lords drew their recruits, began to fall back into lawlessness. Criminals of this world's populace would therefore be transferred into Crusading Legion in the form of fresh recruits. These maniacal murderers, thieves and worse were now gifted with the might of an Astartes and their numbers swirled within a legion whose ways of war were tilting ever more away from tactic and strategy towards murder and genocide. Over time the practice of this legion grew more violently intense. The custom of skinning pits and mass crucifixion were commonplace and their brother Astartes from other legions condemned these practices with abhorrence. Night Haunter himself became ever more isolated from his legionary sons as his visions became more troubling and intense. Conrad would witness his own death again and again, as well as see visions of his father slaying him and his brother Primarchs waging war upon each other. While campaigning with the Imperial Fists and Emperor's Children legions, Conrad confided in his brother Fulgrim, telling him of his troubling visions of the future. Fulgrim in turn spoke to Rogel Dawn on what Conrad had told him though Dawn was a critic of Conrad's, and there was already bad blood between those two. Dawn confronted and condemned Conrad, resulting in a physical altercation between the two Primarchs. Kurz was discovered on top of Dawn, and was in turn banished to his chambers. Kurz would escape aboard his flagship, and flee from his brother's legions into the warp. Having discovered not long prior to this, that his homeworld had fallen back into a state of lawlessness, Conrad had his legion make haste for Nostramo. Above the planet, disgusted by the weakness of his people, Conrad had his fleet destroy the planet entirely, taking every living soul to oblivion. The Night Lord's Legion would now embark on their own crusade of murder and torture across the stars. Countless atrocities and genocides were committed by this legion of unstable sycophants that would make their previous atrocities pale in comparison. Eventually recalled by the Emperor to terror for censure, the Night Lord's fleet never made it to the Sol system. Instead, Conrad answered the call to travel to Isfain V and rendezvous with the other Loyalist elements to bring Horus' rebellion to heel. Somewhere along the way, Conrad had been contacted by Horus or one of his agents and informed of the plan to strike out at the Emperor and his Loyalist legions, though it is not known precisely when this took place. As the events on Isfain V show us, the Night Lords would turn on their brothers, along with elements of the Alpha Legion, Iron Warriors, and Word Bearers. Though that is a story for another day. Mortarian and the Death Guard Mortarian was spiteful of the Emperor, even after his elevation as Primarch of his very own Legion. The source of this rot within him was due to the Emperor slaying Mortarian's tyrant adoptive father back on his homeworld, Barbarus. The Emperor, in an effort to protect Mortarian and slay this Xenos overload, killed him rather than allowing Mortarian to do so. The seed of hatred was planted, and in the years to come this seed would bloom into a great betrayal. Due to this unfortunate event, over the years during the Great Crusade, Mortarion grew close to Horus and prized the kinship and respect of his brother more than his duty to the Emperor. So it was that when Horus whispered to Mortarion of betrayal, it was not a difficult thing to secure his brother's legion and loyalty. It is at the time of the Great Crusade we are also introduced to Typhon, first captain of the Death Guard and second in command to Mortarion himself. Typhon, as some would be aware, 
would go on to become Typhus in the 40k setting, champion of Nurgle and host of the Destroyer Hive. It is during the Great Crusade, a Death Guard force led by Typhon is joined by a word bearer's contingent led by Erebus. Erebus introduced Typhon to the Path of Chaos through the use of the Warrior Lodges. Typhon had a dark secret which none of his brothers within the Death Guard knew. And this was that Typhon was a Psyker. In a legion of Psyker-hating xenophobes, this isn't a great position to be in. Especially if you're the first captain. Erebus discovered Typhon's psychic gift and convinced him that ruinous powers would welcome individuals such as himself. So it was through the machinations of both Typhon and Mortarion, the Death Guard Legion was slowly poisoned from within against the Emperor and those loyal to his cause of unification. When next we see the Death Guard, it is during the scouring of the loyalist elements of the Traitor Legions during the Isfane III Massacre, when Terran-born Nathaniel Garrow discovers the corruption at the heart of his Legion and flees the War Master's fleet, with a few loyal men in a warship called the Eisenstein, with the intention of spreading word to the wider Imperium of Horus' betrayal. Perturabo and the Iron Warriors as is well known to 40k lore veterans, Perturabo, a Lord of Iron, is perhaps the most bitter of all Primarchs. This exemplar of iron will and pragmatism, along with his legion, was thrown into the bloodiest and most gruelling of sieges and protracted war zones throughout the galaxy, which would make a Death Guard blush. In Perturabo's bitter mind, he was seen by his peers and father as nothing more than a tool to break the enemy's fortifications. Whereas due to his imagination and creative genius, we actually discover in the Black Library novel Angel Exterminatus that Perturabo was even more capable at crafting beautiful and creative devices and edifices. Due to their suitability to attrition warfare and the iron resolve Perturabo and his legion possessed, they were thrown repeatedly into the most gruelling and punishing of conflicts. Over time, an enmity bitterness grew within Perturabo and his legion sons. They did not feel their efforts and the losses of their brothers were truly recognised by their fellow legion brothers or the emperor. In their minds, the iron warriors were always stuck with the dirty grunt work, while the glory hounds and favoured primarchs would win all the praise and gratitude of the masses. Horus by this time corrupted and ever the manipulator would use this bitterness and resentment to poison Perturabo against his father. The rising flames of bitterness and rage within Perturabo would soon morph into a raging inferno as Horus broke word to him that his homeworld of Olympia had rebelled against the rule of the Imperium. The anger and resentment inside Perturabo, the feeling that he was thrown at the worst the galaxy had to throw at him by his father and brothers as a means of proving himself and now the only Primarch who couldn't maintain control of his own homeworld was too much for even the superhuman will of the Lord of Iron. Perturabo and his legion would come to execute a grand campaign against their own homeworld. Millions of citizenry were butchered in the ensuing campaign and many more enslaved. His world was in ruins. He, as the protector, had become the murderer, committing genocide on a worldwide scale. Horus, away from the years of the Imperium, would help Perturabo to realise that the Emperor would never forgive the course of action Perturabo had taken, and Perturabo, without options but embittered towards the Imperium which had treated him so poorly, would vow to side with the traitor legions and Horus against his father's rule. So it was the Iron Warrior's first steps on the road to damnation were taken. Perturabo and his legion would travel to Isane Five to bring the rebellious Horus to justice, only to turn on their erstwhile brothers. The slaughter to follow would damn the traitor legions for all time, and form bloody packs of revenge between traitor and loyalist marine. I really hope you've enjoyed my comprising and retelling of 40k lore. If you have enjoyed it or want to be alerted to more of my videos as I plan to upload each week, please consider leaving a like and subscribe. Until next time, stay safe and take it easy.